We exalt you, Lord, over every challenge, over every problem, over every difficulty, over every situation. We exalt you. We magnify you. We magnify you in our lives. We magnify you in our homes. And we thank you that as we magnify you, the problem, the challenge, the difficulty seems oh so small. And we thank you that as we enter your courts with thanksgiving, and as we enter your courts with praise, rejoicing you, thanking you in advance for the victory, we thank you that as we rejoice, that as we lift our hands, as we open our mouths, as we do what Paul said, and we sing with our spirit and we sing with the mind, we thank you that as we do that, as we praise you, as we rejoice, we thank you in advance for the victory. We thank you in advance for the things that we have asked for, for the things that we have sought, for the things that we have desired, for the things that we have prayed for. We thank you in advance for the victory, in advance for the healing, in advance for deliverance and freedom over every challenge, over every problem, over every situation. We come against every attack of the enemy in the name of Jesus, with the blood of Jesus, and we claim victory in the name of Jesus. We claim victory in the name of Jesus. We claim victory in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, every problem must bow, every difficulty must bow, all lack must bow, every sickness, every disease, every infirmity must bow and must go at that name. In the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you today. You are sending forth your word, healing, each and every single person. We thank you that your power is present to save, that your power is present to heal, that your power is present to deliver, that your power is present to fill, your power is present to set free. We thank you, we thank you, we thank you. We give you the praise, we give you the glory, we give you the credit, we give you the honor. Hallelujah. We exalt thee. We exalt thee. A lot of people spend their entire lives exalting everything but God. And they fail to realize if they would exalt God, they would have the victory. And so when you're tempted to worry, when you're tempted to be anxious about anything, we're to cast every care, every anxiety, every worry, every concern upon Jesus. You do that. If he's got the worry, if he's got the problem, that means you don't have it anymore. So by faith then, you must lift your hands you must open your mouth. You must begin to rejoice, to enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise, exalting God. The more you exalt God, the smaller the problems get. And if you'll keep exalting God, you'll notice the problems are gone. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We praise you. We exalt you. There is nothing like his presence. Hallelujah. You may be seated, and we'll go to the Word. We are continuing the series, What Did Jesus Really Say? What Did Jesus Really Say? And this morning, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 9, headed into Matthew chapter 10. Now, as we begin, I want to again draw your attention to one of the most important verses in the entire Bible. In Matthew 9, which is Matthew 9 and verse 29. And we dealt with this last week, where two blind men are healed. But Matthew 9 and verse 29, it is critical, it is key, it is fundamental, no matter what it is you're believing God for. It could be for a son or daughter to come to faith in Christ. It could be for a miracle in your life. Maybe you're a young couple and you're believing God to have a child. The doctors have told you that you can't. All things are possible. All things are possible. Maybe it's a financial situation. God's put something on your heart to do. 
and you desire to do it, but you need the funds. Maybe it's an issue of healing. Matthew 9 and verse 29, according to your faith, let it be to you. Some translations say, according to your faith, will it be done unto you. And so you have to have eyes to see that in your life right now, you're living with the results of your faith. And you might say, well, you know, Austin, that's not something I really want to think about. Well, you could get discouraged, you could get offended, you could get disappointed, you could get bitter, you could get frustrated, or you could say, you know what, I'm going to go to the Word of God, I'm going to find out what it says, I'm going to begin believing what it says, doing what it says, so that I may receive all that God has for me. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? You know, there are people, I'm, go, I'm going backwards. They say, I'm going backwards, I'm going backwards, I'm going backwards. Well, what do they have faith for? Going backwards. I'm broke, I'm broke, I'm broke. What do they have faith for? I'm sick, I'm sick, I'm sick. You know, they get every flu. Dog flu, chicken flu, bird flu, rat flu, whatever kind of flu there is. Well, what do they have faith for? Get in the flu. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? And if you say, well, Austin, in my life, I lack faith, Paul tells us in Romans 10 and 17, faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, you're not going to get faith watching Netflix. You're not going to get faith watching sports. Now, I love to go to a Rangers game like anybody else does. There's not a lot of people there, so the tickets are kind of cheap right now. That's a whole different conversation. But I don't, I'm not sitting at the Rangers game getting faith. Does that make sense? Just trying to make sure nobody around me spills their beer on me. I think that happened once at a Cowboys game or something. It's not fun. Thankfully, they spilled it on me and not my father. That wouldn't have been good. <laughs> you don't get faith listening to Katy Perry or if you spent the weekend going to see straight out of Compton, you didn't come out of there full of faith and then go lay your hands on the sick and see them recover. Amen. And actually, you can watch or listen to some stuff and not... Not only not get faith, you can get full of something else by the time you're done. Right. Remember one time I was at my parents on a Sunday afternoon, you know, and I might try and just watch something like old, old, classic, whatever, but I was flipping through to see what was on, and they were showing some R&B concert, and the only word I would know to describe it is devilish. Does that make sense? But then I see young people on Facebook, I'm going to see so-and-so, well, you're not going to get full of faith. You're going to get full of the devil. Amen. I wonder why I don't have faith for whatever it is you're believing for. Well, it's because of all the things you've been filling your life with all throughout the week. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? Now, let's go to verse 35. And we dealt with this a little bit last week, but I want to pick up at verse 35. It says, Jesus went about all the cities and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom. So both teaching and preaching. And both have their role, both have their place. But you should know the word of God in both the Old and the New Testament mentions teaching more than preaching. And there are, there are Sundays where it's just the way God wants it whether it's my father at nine or it's me at 11, it's more preaching. Then there are Sundays, like last week, it's more teaching, or like last week, it's teaching, but then all of a sudden, you shift gears and it's preaching. But anytime you are a Christian or know a Christian and they don't want to be taught, it's a Christian not interested in growth and maturity. And there are people, and they want to go to a conference or they want to go to a special service or whatever it is, and get worked up into a frenzy, get all excited. But a year later, they're still just as broke, 
just as defeated, just as bound, just as addicted, and just as sick. Now, they might have taken their shoes off and got barefoot and done a few laps. Maybe they even got a flag and waved a flag. If you, you bring a flag, we'll have an usher break it in half. They might even use it to poke you on your way out to go somewhere else. You ought to be making progress. You ought to be growing. You ought to be maturing. And anytime there's a Christian and a year after year goes by and they're not growing, they're not maturing, they're not making progress, they are somebody that doesn't want to be taught. And Jesus was constantly saying, if you have ears to hear, hear. Eyes to see. Not everybody does, so you must purpose in your heart, I'm not going to get offended. I'm going to have a heart that listens, that receives, that grows, that matures into completion, into perfection. Amen? You know that when I was growing up and my father would take me to ministers meetings or conferences, he taught me to keep my mouth shut but to see with my eyes and to observe. And that would always bother me when year after year you would see people making no progress. Well, Dad, how come this young man, he sits next to this pretty young lady year after year but never asks her to marry him? What's wrong with him? No progress. No progress. No progress. Well, Austin, I object. Well, how many people have you led to faith in Jesus Christ just this year? I don't, I don't agree. Well, how many people have you laid your hands on and seen them healed this year? How much money have you given into the kingdom of God this year? Well, well nothing. I hate to break it to you, but our two little girls, who are about to be three and five, they give in every service. So if you're not a giver, you're not even at the level of my three-year-old and five-year-old. So instead of trying to figure out why you're not blessed like Pastor Gene, maybe you should first ask why you're not blessed like Sophia Michaela. <laughs> Teaching and what? Preaching, but we need both. We need both. I mean, there are times when we were in Mombasa, I mean, we'd preach, but the people also have to be taught. And if people, they hear teaching, get angry, that tells you their heart's not right and they're not interested in growing and maturing in the kingdom of God. So teaching and preaching the gospel. And so what was he teaching and preaching? The gospel. The good news. Which is what? That God saves, God heals, God delivers, God blesses. I mean, when you hear people, many times it's not good news, it's bad news. Well, I want to tell you about God, but your problem's not going to change. That's not good news, that's bad news. Jesus went to the cross so that we could be forgiven of our sins, so that we could be healed of every sickness, of every disease, and so where there's lack, there could be plenty. He went to the cross, spirit, soul, and body, to save us, spirit, soul, and and body. Salvation is for the entirety of your life. That's the good news. So teaching and preaching what? The good news. And I'll get to it later, but I want to point out, you go to Mark 16, Jesus gives them instructions. These signs will follow them that believe. So if signs aren't following in your life, you're either not a believer or you're not a doer. Some people believe, but they don't do. Signs won't follow if you don't believe or if you don't do. These signs will follow them that believe. But then it says at the very end that God worked with them confirming the word. God confirms the word. Not your opinions. Not your theories. Not your bright ideas. Not your criticisms. He confirms what? The word. So you preach the word of salvation, and he confirms the word with what? People getting saved. You preach what the word says about healing, and he confirms the word with what? People getting healed. You preach his word concerning finances and blessing and provision, he confirms the word with what? 
blessing, provision, finances. Well, I listen to preacher so-and-so, and he doesn't ever talk about blessing. Well, God won't confirm a word that's not preached. He confirms the word we preach. I've told the story several times, but I think it bears repeating. One day in the office, I overheard a school teacher saying to another school teacher that her, her preacher, her husband, excuse me, her husband liked listening to a certain preacher. And I was so grieved hearing that because I knew that because of who her husband listens to, that there is going to be defeat after defeat in their life. And of course, they wonder why there's defeat, 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 defeat. It has everything to do with the preacher you're listening to. Teaching and preaching what? The gospel, the good news of the kingdom. Then doing what? Healing every sickness and disease among the people. Say every. 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 See, I think sometimes we just need to go home. We just need to set aside whatever books we've been reading. And a book can be either good or bad or neutral. Does that make sense? You know, and you ought to, I think there's a time or place for entertainment, but you ought to read things that improve your life, amen? You know, so you might want to set down those naughty novels you buy checking out at Albertsons or whatever. You know, with Fabio on the cover. People are like, who is that? That's not going to help you be more productive on the job. Amen? Amen. But I think sometimes, even if you're reading books about making more money or being more productive on the job or whatever, or you're on vacation, you're reading an adventure book or whatever it is, sometimes we just need to set aside what we're reading and just open our Bibles and begin to read the Word to find out what the Word really says. Healing every sickness and every disease among the people. Well, Austin, what about what I'm facing? Every sickness and every disease. Well, what about this situation? Every. What about what my, my mother-in-law is facing? Every. What about what my husband's facing in his body? Every. Every sickness and every disease. Well, I, I have trouble believing that. Well, set aside what you've been reading. Set aside what you've been listening to. Set aside the preachers you've been listening to and begin to open up the word for yourself to read what it says and read this verse until you get it and get it down into your spirit, man, and into your heart. Every sickness, every disease. That's the will of God. And see, Jesus, he said in John's gospel, what you see me doing, that's what the Father is doing. You, if you've seen me, you've seen who? The Father. Jesus was the perfect expression when he walked this earth. He was the perfect expression of the will of God. Every sickness, every disease. But once again, what does Matthew 9 and verse 29 say? According to your faith, will it be done unto you? Well, I believe sometimes it's the will of God to heal and sometimes it's not. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? Well, I believe God can heal headaches, but he can't kill, heal cancer. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? I believe the last time God healed anybody was, was before Peter died. According to your faith, will it and is it in your life being done unto you? Every sickness and every disease. But when he saw the multitudes, the people, he was moved with compassion. And as I said, we should be a church that's moved with compassion. When we see people lost, we should be moved with compassion. When we see people and their homes are falling apart, we should be moved with compassion. When we see people that are bound and addicted by drugs and all sorts of addictions, we should be moved with compassion. When we see people that are sick in their body, we should be moved with compassion. Now, what we shouldn't have compassion for is people's nonsense. And a lot of times, people in church, when they have nonsense, it's a distraction of the enemy to distract us from the people we ought to be ministering to and having compassion on. If you need counseling, fill out the very long form. That'll ask you if you're a tither, and then you can meet with Pastor Sue. And if you're a man who has a monthly... She specializes in handling those situations. (laughs) 
See, when, when people, a married couple, show up on Friday screaming and yelling at each other, wanting an emergency meeting, that's a distraction of the enemy to keep us distracted from what? What we're doing right here, right now, today. Well, how come Austin doesn't come out to talk to people before the second service? So Satan doesn't have an opportunity to talk to me before I'm supposed to minister the word. So I can be focused on what the Holy Spirit wants us to deal with and address each and every single week. He was moved with compassion because they were weary and scattered like sheep having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Now, as I said, most times this is the case, but we ought to do something about it. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Well, not in this church. The harvest is plentiful, but typically youth groups aren't on fire for God. Well, not in this church. The harvest is plentiful, but typically Christians don't witness. Not in this church. The harvest is plentiful, and the laborers are many at Faith Christian Center. See, what... Verse 29, according to your faith, is it being done unto you? Well, you know, the young people, I just don't know what we're going to do with them. Father God, I thank you that our young people are full of the Holy Ghost and the fire of God. I thank you that our young people, they aren't compromisers. They aren't backsliders. According to your faith, is it being done unto you? Therefore, Pray, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. And if we ask, Jesus said the Sermon on the Mount, ask and you will what? See, seek and you will what? Knock and the door will what? Be opened unto you. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus was moved with compassion. In January of this year, out of the blue, a young man came to me addicted to an incredible life of sexual promiscuity, bound by several types of drugs, and he wasn't just using, he was selling, under intense spiritual demonic attack and oppression. He repented, he recommitted his life that day. He was filled with the Holy Ghost and the fire of God. And then that young man became a one-man wrecking crew against the kingdom of darkness. I mean, that was a Tuesday or Wednesday before Sunday. He told me he went and he prayed with the girl he knew from Mansfield High School that was sick in her body, severe back pain, and on drugs. And at TGI Fridays or whatever, he said, let me pray for you. I mean, right in front of everybody, laid hands on her. She was healed in her body. She felt the power of God flow into her back. And she was set free from drugs and cigarette smoking that day. Now that young man did more for the kingdom of God in six months than most people do in their entire lives. Laying hands on people, praying with people, witnessing to people. And the enemy came against that young man. And so a few weeks ago, I went on a Saturday preparing for Sunday and stood where he is buried. And like Jesus, I wept. And moved with compassion, David said we recite our verses for who? And so there I said, Lord, you said, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers. This young man was a laborer, and he was stolen from us. But your word says that if the enemy steals, it must be repaid sevenfold. And so I said, Lord, I ask you for seven young men, like an axe, like Stephen, like Philip, full of the Holy Ghost, the fire of God and faith in their belly, I ask you for seven young men like this young man. 
to destroy the works of the enemy, to come against the works of the enemy, to come against the kingdom of darkness. Ask, and you will receive. Well, I don't know why I don't have. And I don't know the exact reference. You can Google it, look it up. You're on your phone. Some of you are on your phone anyway. The word says we have not because we what? We ask not. So stop blaming God. Stop blaming your third grade teacher. Open your Bible. Get in the prayer closet. Go to God and ask, and you will what? Receive. Verse 1, chapter 10, and when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them what? Authority Authority. Authority over unclean spirits, exousia, he gave them authority. The King James, the New King James says power, but it's exousia, authority. He gave them authority over unclean spirits. Well, there's Austin, my house is like Amityville. Well, If your house is like Amityville, it's your fault. What have you been watching in your house? What and who have you been sleeping with in your house? Well, the 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 the, I'm gonna be on that show on TV where they you know do paranormal activity. If you are born again, if you are a believer, we have authority over all the works of the enemy. And so if there's a work of enemy, the enemy going on in your life, you are permitting it. Well, the central place of satanic activity is in my teenager's bedroom. So who pays the mortgage payment? Your teenager? Who pays your car payment? Your 15-year-old little girl that just told you to F off? Who's in charge? Well, she, she, she needs her personal space. No, you need to cast the devil out of her. <laughs> then you need to get your drill out and take the hinges off the door and say, well, my Lord said what is hidden in darkness will be exposed to the light. So, baby, here comes the light. I mean, who's in charge? My father, years back, he went to visit someone's home and went in the teenager's room. And back then it was Metallica and Kiss. I mean, Kiss literally means knights in Satan's service. I mean, you listen to Eminem, you listen to Beyonce, Well, I wonder why my 15-year-old has a tendency to want to slap me and slap women. Well, he listens to men. That's the spirit they have, and that's the spirit in their music. He gave them what? Exousia. And so we have the authority, but we must exercise the authority over unclean spirits to what? To counsel them. To hug them. To cast them out. And you might need to practice this. I mean, if if your schnauzer doesn't listen to you, you need to work on speaking with authority. (laughs) Well, devil, if you could just go and leave us alone. Come out! Not here, not in my house, not in your life. Come out in Jesus' name. Well, I think I have a devil, and I'm going to speak to you afterwards. Well, I'm not going to give you a hug. I could embarrass you in front of everyone when I say, come out. See, people play nice with the devil and they wonder why the devil is at work in their life. You must drive him out. That's why you, if you have to go home and throw some stuff out, go home and throw some stuff out. Well, my, my husband has a collection of 
get a trash bag and fill it and then ask him if he has a job. I don't know what to do. Stop feeding him. <laughs> Paul said if a man doesn't work, he should not eat. So biblically, he should stop eating until he goes to work. And I don't know what it is about these single mothers. Well, I feel responsible for him. Your responsibility is your children. If he's not the father of your children, and he's living with you, shacked up in sin setting a horrible example, while you go to work and work your rear end off to provide for the family, you need to cast him out just like you need to cast the devil out. If you want something to feed and potty train, get a dog. I think I'm going to go to the 9 a.m. service. Listen to today's message. It'll bless you. To heal, now we just saw verse 35 said every sickness, every disease, but look at, look at what verse 1 says, to heal how many kinds of sickness? All. And how many kinds of disease? All. Now the names of the 12 are these, Simon, who is called Peter, Andrew, his brother, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And I love how in Mark's gospel it says they were the sons of thunder. We need more of that today, amen. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus, Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These 12 Jesus sent out and commanded them. So it's not optional. Do not go into the way of the Gentiles and do not enter a city of the Samaritans. And we see Jesus refer to this several other places before the resurrection, his ministry was for the children of Abraham, the Jews. But after he went to the cross and his father raised him from the dead, he then said, go into all the world. And there in the gospels, like when the woman came to him with the child in need, she said, well, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And she received her healing for the child. But Jesus said repeatedly, before the crucifixion, before the cross, his ministry was to the sheep of Israel. He affirms that. Verse 7, as you go, preach saying the kingdom of God is at hand. Well, it's here now. Amen. Verse 8, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Here's something else so important you must see. Freely you have received, freely give. Now, in your life, if you were to say, I'm not going to go to the bathroom. I'm going to just keep eating for the next seven days. What would happen? Probably by about Friday, you might explode. But that's how a lot of people are in church. Bless me, bless me, bless me, but they don't ever do anything for God or the kingdom. When was the last time you witnessed to somebody? When was the last time you prayed with somebody? When was the last time you went and visited somebody in the hospital or you prayed with somebody who was sick? And so they spend their entire lives wondering why they're not more blessed when they don't do anything for the kingdom of God. He gives them a very powerful principle here. Freely you have received, now do what? Freely give. What, what keeps the channel, the flow of blessings open? Being a giver. Being a giver, being a giver, being a giver. And not just of money. Being a giver of what? The good news. Being a giver of what? The healing power of God. The delivering power of God. The saving power of God. Well, I, I need God to do this. If you're sick in your body, find somebody this week. Do you go pray for them to be healed? And you just watch what God will do in your life. Freely you have received, freely give. Why do some people, they receive, but then they don't receive anymore? It's because they never become a giver. They never give. God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 9, gives seed to the sower. If you're not a sower, you have no need for God to give you seed. And he's not a dummy. You know, your mother or your father may be dumb enough to keep giving you money. You're like 45. Well, I, 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 need, I need money for Madden 2016.
But God, Father God, ain't that stupid. Money for what? Well, I I'm going to sit at home in my mother's basement. He's not an idiot. He's the creator of the heavens and the earth. Provide neither gold nor silver nor copper in your money belts nor bag for your journey nor two tunics nor sandals nor staffs for a worker is worthy of his food, his keep, his provisions. Elsewhere in the New Testament it says the worker is worthy of his wages. Well, Brother Austin, this shows that we are to do without he told them to go out like this so they would learn to look to God for provision. As a young man, Leonard Ravenhill and several other young men, for years they walked from one side of England to the other, like this, living by faith, and they were provided for and they were given food and clothes and provision and places to stay every step of the way. He sent them out like this so they would learn to walk by faith and not by sight. But he says a worker is worthy of his food, his wages, his keep. So he's not saying go out like this and you're going to starve. Go out like this, they didn't have cars, you're going to sleep in your car. Go out like this, you're going to sleep in the street. He's saying a worker is worthy of what? His keep. Now look over at Luke's gospel in Luke chapter 22. Luke 22, beginning in verse 35, it says, Jesus said to them, Referring to the first time he sent them out, the twelve, when I sent you without money, bag, knapsack, and sandals, did you lack anything? Oh, Brother Austin, the Lord wants to keep you in need. Like some people say, my mom, her dad was on the board of the church she grew up in, and they would say, you know, Lord, help us keep our preacher poor and you keep him humble. He sent them out in lack, we're to be in lack. Look at what Jesus says. Did you lack anything? What did they say? Nothing. Nothing. So if there's lack in your life, it's not because it's the will of God. It's because you've missed it. You've missed it somewhere in your life and you have to begin evaluating what it is you're believing, what it is you're doing to find out where you have missed the provision of God. They lacked what? Nothing. And then he says, from this day forward, now, 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 he who has a money bag, let him take it. Likewise, a knapsack, and he who has no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. Now, my father has a sword in his office for sermon illustration purposes. I guess if I carried it around this week, people would wonder what's up. But there are modern 21st century substitutes that we could substitute for this. So how does that fit with the culture and society portraying Jesus as effeminate? And so don't be surprised if you ever hear a story, well, Pastor Sue was at Target and somebody up to the works of darkness approached her and she blew them away with the 45. If you get offended, I'm going to say, well, Jesus said to carry a sword. So Pastor Sue, she'd be armed and dangerous. Don't mess with Pastor Sue. That's why if you're an Xboxer, now not if you're 15, but if you're 45 and you're one of these that the wives, they tell my wife, Jessica's like, Austin, you need to stop referring to anything anybody tells me because they're going to know it's me. But he won't come to bed. He wants to stay up to get to level five. <laughs> Did you lack anything? Nothing. So if there's lack, it's not of God. If there's lack, it's not of God. Now, back to Matthew 10, verse 11. Now, whatever city or town you enter, inquire who in it is worthy and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace, we could say blessing, come upon it. 
But if it is not, let your peace return to you. Jesus said there were those that believed him. There were those that rejected him. Why would we, why would we think it would be any different for us? So you've witnessed to somebody 25 times. Well, move on and start witnessing to somebody else. Amen? Not, we are to present the good news to everyone, but not everyone's going to believe. Not everyone's going to accept it. Does that make sense? Whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, have a crying party, have a pity party, go on Oprah or Dr. Phil. When you depart from that house or city, shake the dust off your feet. Shake the dust off. So somebody, you witness to them and they, they cussed you out. Shake the dust off your feet. You offered to pray with somebody that's sick in their body and they got angry. They cussed you out. Shake the dust off your feet. You, you've got a family member. They've been a Christian for 55 years, but they still poop their pants spiritually and live in the nursery. <laughs> Baby Samuel needs a diaper, but that's because he's two weeks old. If you've been in church 25 years and you still need diapers and Pastor Sue to change your diapers... It's time to grow up. And there are come times where we just have to simply shake the dust off our feet. Now, what religious people will say is, well, Brother Austin, this was the 12. And there were 12. And when the 12th man died, God stopped doing anything. Open your Bible. Read it for yourself. And in the next few minutes, I'm going to totally demolish that. Turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 10. Here he sends out 70 others. Some translations say 72. Two by two. But you have to understand that in church tradition, the first several hundred years, they referred to a group of people as the 70, but it included many more than the 70. For instance, in Acts, the seven, Stephen, Philip, and others... They were the seven, but later on the church considered them a part of the 70. What does that mean? Men full of faith, the Holy Ghost, the anointing and the power of God doing the works of Jesus. So he sends out 70 others here. Much of what he says is similar, similar to what he tells the 12. He tells them, look at verse 7, the labor is worthy of his wages. Verse 9, heal the sick. Well, only... The original 12 could do that. Well, in my Bible, in Luke 10 and verse 9, it says, Jesus said to the 70, heal the sick. Then you go over, you look where it says, verse 17, the 70 return with joy saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. Verse 19, behold, I give you authority, exousia, to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. So if you're living a life of defeat, it's not the will of God and you're actually living outside the will of God. It's time to get in the will of God and walk into the authority and walk in the authority that Jesus Christ paid the price for on the cross. He paid the price. His father raised him from the dead. It says he has sat down, but have eyes to see it. Paul says we are seated with him in heavenly places. And he has given us the authority. He has delegated it to us. Nevertheless, do not rejoice in this that the spirits are subject to you, but rather rejoice your names are written in heaven. Now go over to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 6. Here in Acts 6, they choose the seven to help them with the waiting on tables. And as I said, distractions during the week for pastor, for me, for Aaron, or any of us, it's all to get us distracted from what we're to be about, which is Acts 6 and verse 4, where they said, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and the ministry of the word. So they chose seven. One of them, verse 5, was Stephen. It says, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did what? He only led people to the Lord because if you're not one of the original 12, that's all you can do. What does it say Stephen did? 
He did great wonders and signs among the people. Now turn over to Acts chapter 8, another example. See, well, why do people talk that way? Well, God, he used to, but he doesn't anymore. They, they themselves lack faith. According to your faith, will it be done unto you? Well, he doesn't do that anymore, and I have proof in my ministry no one gets healed. <laughs> According to your faith, will it be done unto you? Acts 8, verse 4, Therefore those who were scattered went everywhere, preaching what? The Word. Well, I preach, but nothing happens. Well, what are you preaching? He confirms the Word. Not our bright ideas, not our opinions, not our theories. Preaching what? The Word. Verse 5, then this Philip is the, one of the seven. Philip the deacon, not Philip the apostle. Philip the deacon. He went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And the multitudes with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing what? The miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed and there was great joy in that city. So we see that you had the 12, you had the 70, then you had the 7. I've given two examples from the 7. Stephen and Philip the deacon. And any time any idiot says, well, after the twelfth man died. And they show how stupid they are. Because one of the twelve betrayed Jesus and was replaced. Matthias was his replacement. Now you may have missed this class in second grade. What is twelve plus one? A young man last week said, I, I want to go deeper. Here's deep. What's twelve plus one? Thirteen. Paul was not one of the original twelve. But he was what? an apostle. Barnabas was not one of the original twelve, but he was what? An apostle. Andronicus was not one of the original twelve, but he was what? An apostle. Junia, and what dude do you know named Junia, was an apostle, but was not one of the original twelve. And James, the leader of the church at Jerusalem, the half-brother of Jesus, who came to faith after his brother, his half-brother died and died for our sins, that we may be forgiven, that we may be healed. And after God raised him from the dead, after all of that, James, a half-brother, came to faith in Christ. And he is called an apostle, but he was not one of the original 12. See, my parents taught me to read. They taught me to do math. Now let's go over to Mark 16. And this is for all of us. Say, this is for me. Every believer is to be a witness, and if you're a believer who's not a witness, you're outside the will of God, and you're living in disobedience to God. Every believer is to be a witness, and if you are not a witness, you are living outside the will of God, and you are living in disobedience to God, and that is one of the reasons why there is lack in your life. Mark 16, beginning in verse 15, he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Well, Austin, I had a college professor, a Bible school professor, a seminary professor, and he said God doesn't want all to be saved. Well, that's funny, because in my Bible, Paul told Timothy that he wants all to be saved. And it's not that all will believe, but all should have the opportunity to believe and have faith in Christ. To go into how much of the world? All. all. And preach the gospel to how many creatures? All. Every. All. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. But he who does not believe will be condemned. So we know from what Jesus said. Some will believe, some won't. And these signs, verse 17, these signs, they might follow. These signs, if it's the will of God. What does it say? These signs will follow those who what? Believe. Signs follow those who believe. And so if signs aren't following, the problem is not on God's end. The problem is not with his word. The problem is on our end. Do we believe? 
well, Austin, I'm struggling with believing. Well, you need to spend more time in the Word and less time with other things. There's a time, there's a place for entertainment, but try watching one episode on Netflix instead of 25. Amen. These signs will follow them who what? Believe. Believe. What signs are those? See, he doesn't even say these signs will follow the 12, these signs will follow the 7. What is the criteria? What is the qualification? Believing. In my name. In whose name? The name of Jesus. So maybe you went to college and they taught you to pray incorrectly. Dear Mother Earth. Well, you're not going to get your prayers answered. Dear Buddha. Buddha is dead. Buddha, in fact, is so dead, they had to move his body for a highway a few years ago. And it's just bones now. I wasn't going to say his rather big body, but it's just bones now. But whether you have skinny Buddha or fat Buddha or whatever Buddha you have, Buddha is dead. I mean, every year in Mecca, they all go to look where supposedly the prophet Muhammad's bones are. A dead religion for dead people that encourages people to kill themselves. Dead, dead, dead. These signs will follow them that believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. So the baptism of the Holy Ghost and speaking and praying in tongues is part and parcel with everything that we are to be about as the children of God, as the church. Well, why is there so much opposition to praying in the Spirit in tongues? Because it is powerful. Because when you pray in the Spirit, when you speak in tongues, you pray, you speak the perfect will of God without interference. Instead of praying your bright ideas, you pray exactly what the Holy Spirit knows needs to be prayed. It is powerful. And that is why Satan is so against it. And he has sought for 2,000 years to rob the church of what belongs to her. Verse 18, they will take up serpents. Now when you read this, we've all seen the documentary on PBS about people living in Kentucky. They handle snakes. But we interpret the word by the word. When Paul was shipwrecked on the island, what happened? He was sitting by a fire. A poisonous snake came out of the wood and what? Bit him. Did it harm him? No. And it was a sign and wonder that brought thousands of people on the island to faith in Christ. So we don't go do stupid stuff saying, Lord, protect me. I mean, even when Satan tempted Jesus and said, cast yourself down and the angels of God will save you, Jesus corrected him with the word. So wear your seatbelt when you drive. Put your phone down. Stop texting while you drive. Well, you know, I don't know why brother so-and-so was in a terrible accident. I don't know why minister so-and-so died on his way to a revival meeting. Because the idiot was FaceTiming or on Periscope while he was driving. Stupid. He blesses us as we minister, not as we do our own thing in stupidity. If they drink any deadly thing. Well, that's the mission field right there. Amen? I mean, my parents, they've told, they've told stories. I've been in places with, with Aaron and others where they, it's like Indiana Jones. They put the food in front of you, but it's still moving. It is anything but well done. Hallelujah. And you are like, I'm going to pray in tongues for a while before I eat this. If they drink any deadly thing, it will by no means hurt them. And they will what? They will lay the hands on the sick and they will what? They will what? Recover. They will get well. They will be healed. They will be made whole. They will, they will, they will, they will, they will. They will recover. They will be healed. They will be made whole. Well, I'm just not so sure. See, th these signs follow who? Them that believe. So you, get, you set the things of the world aside. You begin to get the word of God in you. And faith rises up in your heart. And you become a believer, not a doubter. You begin believing. Signs begin following. And then stuff starts happening. Where there's lack, all of a sudden, there's provision. Where the devil's just been having his way, suddenly the devil is cast out. And bondage is cast out. And addiction is cast out. And epilepsy is cast out. And sickness must go. 
That's not optional. They lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now look at what it says. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. And they went out and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them, confirming what? The word. The word. Through what? Through the accompanying signs. He confirmed the word with what? Signs. We preach the word of salvation, he'll confirm it. We preach his word in regards to healing, he will confirm it. We preach, well, Brother Austin, in my Baptist church, no one receives the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, when was the last time the preacher in that church preached out of 1 Corinthians 12 or 14? Or Acts chapter 2? I laugh some of these guys, they do a whole expositional series through the book of Acts, and yet they skip like half of it. There was a famous preacher years ago, and he literally preached through the entire Bible, except he skipped two chapters. He preached through the entire Bible before he died, but he skipped two chapters. 1 Corinthians 12 and 1 Corinthians 14. God confirms what? The Word. And faith, faith comes by hearing what? And so if people don't hear about healing, they won't have faith to be healed. If people don't hear about the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they will not have faith to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If faith do not hear, if people do not hear the word about healing, they will not have faith to receive the word of healing. Amen? Amen. Look at Acts chapter 14. This is one of the most powerful passages in the books in the book of Acts. Acts chapter 14. And I'm in a new Bible, so I don't have this highlighted. I am looking at it. Looking for the verse where it says the man had faith to be healed. Nine. Thank you. Verse 8 in Lystra, a certain man without strength in his feet was sitting, a cripple from his mother's womb, who had never walked. This man heard Paul what? Speaking. What do you think Paul was speaking? 25 steps to a cleaner kitchen. Paul, observing him intently, seeing he had faith to be healed. Now, do you want to have your mind blown for the rest of the week? <laughs> they translate this healed based on the context, but that's not actually what it says. It says, he seeing him, that he had faith to be saved. The word here is the word for salvation. Faith to be healed is no different than the faith you need for salvation. And Paul said, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if we confess with our mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in our hearts that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. So if you confess with your mouth what the word says about healing, and believe in your heart that what the word says is true, you will be what? Healed. healed. It works the same for healing or prosperity or anything. This man heard Paul speaking, Paul observing him intently and seeing he had faith to be healed, said with a loud voice, stand up straight on your feet. And he leaped and walked. Then it gave Paul a situation he had to deal with. Please bow your heads. Close your eyes. If you're here today and say, Austin, I want to give my life to God. I want to surrender my life to God. I've never heard about God like this, that he is good, that he wants to do good in my life. And through me, he wants to do good in the lives of others. And our natural response to the good news should be to surrender our lives to him, to give him our lives, to make Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of our lives. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And he said, a man must be born again. This life is so short. And when it comes to an end, there's only two destinations, heaven or hell. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus Christ, by making him the Lord and the Savior of your life. 
It's not just praying a prayer. It's not just saying, well, I'm going to get a Jesus stamp on my life and then go out and live every, however I want. No, it is surrendering the entirety of your life to Him. He gave His life for you. Now you're to give your life to Him and to spend the rest of your life living for Him and serving Him and doing what He would have you do. That is what life lived with God is all about. If you're here today and say, Austin, I have never given my life to God. I have never made Jesus Christ the Lord and the Savior of my life, but I know I need to if that's you today. Where you're seated, heads are bowed, eyes are closed, raise your hand. You say, Austin, I've never given him my life, but I know I need to. If that's you, raise your hand. You might also be here today, and at one point in your life, you prayed a prayer, you walked an aisle, but you know in your heart, you are not right with God. There are things in your life, and I may not know about them, the person sitting next to you may not know about them, but you know, and you know, they have put distance between you and God. You have not been living for him. You've been doing your own thing. The Bible tells us that his mercies are new every morning, and that if we confess our sins, he's faithful, he's just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But we must come to him. We must repent. We must confess. And we must say, from this day forward, I recommit my life to you and I will live for you with all my heart from this day forward. If that's you today, you need to recommit your life. You need to make things right. If that's you, please raise your hand. Well, good. Father God, I thank you that each and every person in our midst is a believer. And I thank you that if there's somebody among us that didn't raise their hand so that I could then ask them to come forward, I pray that you would continue dealing with them, dealing with their heart, convicting them by your spirit so that they would fully surrender the entirety of your life to them. That they would fully surrender to you repent of all sin, and make Jesus the Lord and the Savior of their life. And now I pray, Holy Spirit of God, I have presented your word that them that believe, we are to preach the good news, every believer, that them that believe, we are to pray for the sick and lay hands on the sick, that them that believe, every believer, we are to cast out devils. And so I pray that today, now, and all throughout the week, you would make that word come alive in the life, in the heart of each and every single person under the sound of my voice. That each and every single person would see that they must be a witness, that they must share the good news, that they must be a light for you, for the kingdom of God and the dark world in which we live. And that they must, they must be the hands and the feet of Jesus. Not just those in full-time ministry, but every believer. We thank you for it. Now, if you're here today and you're sick, anywhere in your body. And I know every week, typically during the worship, we pray for the sick, but you might be new. And perhaps faith, like the man in Acts 14, as Paul preached, the faith rose up, faith came alive in the man's heart. And so maybe you didn't come forward for the prayer time during worship, but as I preach the word, what it says about healing. And healing, you must know, it is the children's bread. It belongs to you. And you'd say, Austin, I have faith and my heart to receive. One way we can receive is by the laying on of hands, which we do during the worship time. But another way we can receive is simply by faith, reaching out and grabbing what belongs to us, what Jesus paid the, Christ, the price for on the cross. Reach out by faith. Reach out by faith. And so if you are here and you're sick in your body, I want you to just take your right hand and I want you to put it on your body wherever you are sick, wherever you have been suffering in your body, and then I want you to raise your other hand to heaven. Take your right hand, put your right hand on your body, wherever you are sick, wherever you have been suffering, wherever there has been a problem, wherever there has been an issue, and lift your left hand to heaven. I'm going to pray. Lord, I thank you that healing is the children's bread. I thank you that your power is present to heal the sick. I thank you that sickness and disease and infirmity has no right has no place, has no authority in our midst. And I ask you, Lord, now, I ask you, Jesus, to touch, to touch 
each and every single person that is sick in their body to touch them. May you pour out, and I thank you for Naven now, pouring out the healing balm of Gilead upon each and every single person here that has been suffering in their body. I thank you, you are touching them even now. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. I thank you that you still save. You still heal the sick. I thank you, you still send forth your word and heal, and you take every sickness and disease from our midst. I thank you that you are the Lord who heals us of every sickness and disease. So I ask you now to touch every person with a hand on their body, with a hand lifted, touch them. Heal them now from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. And I say by the authority delegated unto us, unto the church, unto every believer, I say now in the name of Jesus, be healed, be free, be set free and suffer no more in the name of Jesus. And now, Lord, we lift our hands. We lift our hands and we thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And we thank you that you have sent forth your word and you've healed us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Look for opportunities this week to be a blessing. Look for opportunities this week to be a witness, to pray with someone. So you've witnessed to your grandmother for 50 years. Shake the dust off your feet and witness to somebody who's receptive. Amen? Amen. He confirms the word. And if you'll let the word come out of your mouth, he'll confirm it every time. Amen?